Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the afternoon session of the DSF 2024 in London. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce our first speaker. Mendes is going to be talking about um, building profitable models and lessons from Marks and Spencers. Uh, Mendes originally started predictive modeling, doing a PhD on air pollution modeling at Vilnius University in Lithuania, and subsequently worked at Dunhumby Accenture and HSBC before moving on to Marks and Spencers. Mendes leads uh, multidisciplinary squads and teams, working closely with business stakeholders to enable better and automated decisions in pricing, advertising, supply chain, and personalization. He blends first hand technical experience, technical skills, and uh, leadership to provide measurable and product productionized outcomes for the business. So over to Mindis. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, my name is Mindis. I'm a lead data scientist on Mark and Spencer's, and thank you for coming to my session. Um, so here's the agenda that um, i like to kind of use the time for today. So first I'm going to speak a little bit about Marks and Spencers. Um, then I will discuss uh, what makes models profitable, how we choose the business problem that um, increases the chances of the model to be, to deliver most impact, how we quantify impact of forecast accuracy, how do we choose the right accuracy metrics, um, and um, how can we leverage probabilistic forecasting to improve um, profitability of our decisions and models. By the way, so if you have any questions, you can just raise the hand, maybe you can. This is, uh, the topic is um, kind of very kind of important and uh, there are no right or wrong answers, so we can kind of have a discussion and come to some, share some knowledge between us. So Marks and Spencer, yeah, so we are um, British retailer, leading British retailer, very old one with a rich history. We, um, um, the, f the business started in uh, 1,884, so it's uh, 140 years old. Um, so we have, um, we are international, so we have stores, uh, stores ac across the world, um, more than 1,000 stores globally, and out of those um, 900 stores is in UK. 30 million known customers and very successful loyalty um, kind of scheme, Sparks. I assume you, there are some members of that scheme. Fingers crossed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, we are online, we are, have stores. Um, we have um, massive um, distribution centers, warehouses. The one was um, this one of the largest in UK is um, in the East Midlands um, next to Nottingham, so it's um, as large as can uh, fit uh, 12 jumbo jets and uh, thousands of buses, I was told. So it's a massive one. Yes, yeah, so let's now deep into retail. Um, retailing is a very kind of complex business, right? So, and especially for m and because we're selling um, our, mostly our own brands. Uh, uh, we sell um, fashion products, um, we sell seasonal products. So we have to kind of plan and execute um, almost everything ourselves. So myself, I mostly work on the uh, clothing and home side of the business. So here is the example of the product life cycle um, in, um, in clothing and home business area. So it starts from uh, designing the style which starts, the season begins, um, we start planning around nine months uh, before the launch. So for example, now we are in uh, kind of end of the spring. So probably what uh, the business partners do, they're now preparing um, kind of launch for the next spring already. So they're creating a design, they're um, um, negotiating those with uh, our um, kind of suppliers. What is the right style we have to bring for the spring collection next year already? So decisions are starts already, you have start making decisions at that point, which now will have impact across uh, kind of the, the whole product life cycle. Um, so yeah, first you have to dis decide um, what style you, you want to kind of order to launch your collection. The next is, um, yeah, what's, what's the quantity, how much of that style you want to buy? What should be distribution of the sizes in that style? Um, so, 
when the buying is done, so the next step would be how you locate now that stock to the stores, right? So which stores have to have which, which uh, kind of products. Once this is done, the next step would be how, to, how much stock to locate to those stores. Yeah, what is that, that initial allocation of the stock when you're launching the, your new, new season, new line? Um, so once that is in, stock is in stores, then you have those everyday decisions to replenish. So how you allocate and replenish the stock to minimize stockouts and to minimize um, risk of the product going into markdown if it's not sold at the, in, at the end of the season. And then also, then you, once the product is available online on stores and the next, um, then we promote the product, promote the product, right? So it's, we have recommenders, we have search, we have a direct um, kind of um, marketing campaigns to kind of to sell that product. Yeah, and once um, kind of at the end of the season, we have to clear, right? So if you haven't sold everything, so we have to run clearance pricing and optimize this. And. Um, Underpinning everything, there is operations, um, kind of trucks delivering um, warehouses and store uh, employees, and everything of those is um, driven by data and, and by models, most of this. Um, so we have two kind of analytical communities that support business functions in that space. We have analytics and data science. So the business planners are the people who actually make those decisions. Um, some decisions are automated, so they don't go directly through the kind of um, through kind of the human decision making process, um, like a replenishment. But um, the key strategic decisions are kind of done by still by people. What analytics and data science does we support those those people? Um, so the difference between analytics and data science communities is um, usually kind of analytic. Analytic teams of analytics, they look at latest data and summarize data, while some kind of data science, we're looking more kind of granular historical data and trying to kind of relate what happened with the context. Okay, if you, um, the product was not selling well, so what we're trying to create and find the explanations why it's not performing well. Um, so now, yeah, so you see there is a massive space of opportunities, um, lots of data. Questions: Where do where do you start, right? Yeah, what do you, where do you invest your scarce data science resource and all this um, um, complex um, kind of system, business system? Um, in the hindsight, the answer usually is very clear, right? If you and the way we um, assess um, our projects, we um, usually run trials. You calculate financial impact of your trial, and then yeah, post. Um, post trial, you can say, okay, that project was successful, and that project was less successful. You calculate ROI, and um, yeah, you can see okay, kind of th that investment was worth the effort, and that investment probably was um, didn't pay off. Um, but in the reality, but the difficulty is that uh, to go into the trial, you have a lot of investment, right? You have to build the models, you have to create infrastructure. And the question is, how can you minimize um, the risk of failure, or how can you? Well, increase chances of success of your model being profitable and del delivering business value. And um, what I also would like to emphasize here that profitability, you know, sometimes uh, there is some people think, okay, if you're trying to make kind of your models profitable, you're just greedy, you kind of just about money, <laughs> but it's not about this. Uh, profitability is uh, a kind of or financial perspective is a way to kind of compare the things, right? It uh, gives you allows you to um, identify opportunities that are worth pursuing or opportunities that are just distraction, right? Maybe um, yeah, improving some model accuracy is fun and uh, interesting, but um, if that doesn't kind of create that currency, which is profitability, it means it's a distraction, right? For the business, it's, uh, there is no, no value in that. <laughs> so the, this financial perspective is um, like a a currency measure that you can compare very different investments, right? Do you sh should you invest in um, kind of data science or should you invest in kind of improving your website or something else or store um, layout? Um, so yeah, so what, uh, so what makes models profitable and how can we kind of try to predict that profitability of the model before go going into the trial? So, so those are kind of six kind of listed kind of six, six main things that uh, we're looking at. Um, 
but uh, say the list can be very sp kind of it's very contextual and in, in guess in every your situation can be slightly different so it starts from <coughs> what is the value of <coughs> of perfect decision and do you need um, um, prediction in the first place to make the decision sometimes um, even if you have like a you know, perfect decision you can calculate that okay the value of that um, decision is it's not that important right it's, the simple baseline, just do what you've done last year, will not have to make much financial difference. Then it's question, okay, is that model accuracy drives decisioning that kind of uses that, uh, your, your models? All those things um, might be um, kind of uh, impacting your success of your model when, you, when you're running the trials or when you're using that in production. And this is kind of like, you know, I put this as a picture, perhaps you've seen that a million times. <laughs> It's a similar kind of sentiment that was a uh, kind of um, presented by Google like you know, 10 years ago that you know, machine learning code is just a small part of this whole machinery, right? So we have probably in, in um, MNS because we are business enterprise much smaller than Google, so there are different kind of blocks that important for us, but still uh, mach um, accuracy of your model or machine, um, our models are probably just a small part of the same kind of those different factors that can be, that relates to success or profitability of your model. Um, so yeah, th so the first, uh, now I'll start putting more slides, <laughs> more pictures, hopefully it will make more exciting. So the first, as, we um, as I mentioned, first thing is to decide is that what is the right uh, problem for the data science. And sometimes it very, it's, very, it's, it's very tempting that uh, we are data scientists, I know kind of generative AI, let's now try to find a problem, try to solve everything with generative AI, or I, I know like GBM, and I try to solve every problem with kind of gradient boosting machine, which is, might be not completely not necessarily important for that. Um, specific problem. Um, so, from data science, yeah, we ask technical specialists, we always, when we come to the business, we come in with our knowledge, with our tools. From other hand, the existing business process, kind of business and um, the process owners, they usually, they don't know those technologies. The only thing they want is like, you know, just make my process better. They want this kind of like, you know, super powered Excel, more data. Um, so there's always that kind of tension between, yeah, what uh, uh, kind of, what is the right solution for, for that business problem they have. And the challenge here is that having people or knowledge in, in between who knows both the business and kind of, and toolkit of the data science that can kind of solve business problems with the right match, do this matching between um, business um, kind of pain points and, um, and what is possible with um, uh, data science tools and data. Um, so now the question for you is, this is story in pictures. What is the similarity, what is the story here between those three kind of photos of pictures? So we have Newton, the alchemist, the ex machina and the Rabbit with the hole. <laughs> so probably, I know what you know that Newton, this one of the smartest guys perhaps in the human history, he spent uh, a lot of his time as an alchemist and trying to come up with philosophical stone. So yes, we know his theories about gravity invented, but he spent so much time kind of, on, you can say wasted his time just trying to solve problem that was completely kind of non-existent. And, um, and beco why? Because he was in love with this, right? Like in this movie, Ex Machina, like, you know, you, he fell in love with his problem and not with, um, with his solution, but not with the problem in itself. And he kind of ended up in the, you can say, in the rabbit hole. It's, he spent a lot of time and he was not able to come up, invent that philosophical stone that he was searching for. So there's always a danger, and I've been myself in that situation that you you become very passionate about your approach, about your model, and then you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, but sometimes you have to kind of look around and say, okay, this is uh, it's not going to work, and you have to stop and kind of move on. 
So what do we do? So in Marcus Spencer, we're trying kind of to make this process kind of as objective as possible. Like, you know, what's, how do we select opportunities and how we kind of quantify them? So we have this uh, new proposal evaluation template. So where we very in very kind of detail details kind of trying to describe what is the problem, yeah, what is the kind of main pain point that you're trying to solve. Um, what is the value? Uh, what is the kind of KPIs that you can use? Uh, what is the expected financial value? Is there any, um, how we can convert that uh, business KPI into kind of financial, va um, fin financial value? The next is stakeholders. Again, it's critically to, to have relationship with stakeholders and the business that um, supporting that problem. If they are not interested or like less interested, it's again, there is a symptom, early signal that is you, it's going to be problems ahead. <laughs> data quality, uh, do we have data? Um, are th those data kind of refresh periodically? Is that data suitable for kind of a production type of model, right? So you can have some data, ad hoc data, Excel data, but if the data is not uh, kind of productionized, yeah, it's, you will not be able to create um, kind of a production ready data science product. Complexity, a another one is um, when we're relating complexity, we're looking, okay, what is, uh, how complex the solution have to be to achieve that business um, uh, kind of minimum to meet that business expectation. Uh, what is the current status of the knowledge or can we use some code line existing that um, can be used to solve that problem? Yeah, and then once we have this, so we um, have this, uh, in this case, just simplified like, you know, two by two kind of matrix where we can say, okay, which you can create some kind of weighted scorecard and say, okay, which products are more promising, which ideas you have to pursue and which ones are probably um, yeah, it's not the right time for some prob problems yet to be solved. Yeah, and timing is another critical uh, kind of aspect of this is good timing is um, also very important. Some opportunities kind of appear and disappear in business and data science and uh, you have to be, have to have the, I some, sometimes say like you no know, shark mentality, right? <laughs> You see opportunity to grab it because it will go away. So in data science as well, like you know, some opportunities to kind of go with business um, to create some valuable product appears. If you miss it, then they might come with another solution. They might buy some ex external vendor, and it will, might be disappear. So you have to be always kind of be active and looking um, for opportunities. Um, so yeah. So now, so let's say now we have this kind of. Um, find promising business problem. Now the next question is uh, very controversial. Does forecast accuracy even matters from your model? And uh, now if you, in supply chain, demand forecasting, there's a kind of heated now debate on LinkedIn and some um, about what's the value of the forecast accuracy. And there are some studies um, show that um, in a very, it's quite recent uh, Kaggle M5 uh, forecasting competition, which was, um, where first time machine learn learning models managed to beat um, those traditional statistical models. It showed some uh, analysis sh that used that forecast to improve stock allocation decision, which was that forecast was meant to be to deliver, showed that uh, that forecast accuracy in most of the cases that didn't matter, where they kind of improved by 20%, but end of the day it didn't matter. In very few cases, it did matter, but the majority of its impact was tiny. So, yes, as a data scientist, you always expect they build a better model, they'll make better decisions. And uh, that's not always the case. We kind of had this experience for, in our projects. Some projects managed to deliver, um, we shown back testing for case, better forecast accuracy, and going forward is better forecast accuracy. But when that forecast was uh, given to um, decision making, kind of the process that uh, kind of takes that forecast and makes decision, it showed that, okay, it didn't generate any better decisions, so the value was, um, didn't have any incremental value. Um, so, yeah, and this is the example, like, 
if you don't believe me that for stochastic curves sometimes doesn't matter, <laughs> here's a kind of small example. So you, let's say you have um, um, forecast, and you want to, based on that forecast, you want to send, uh, make a replenishment decision to send product to the stores, right? If they predict to sell more, you would like to send more uh, stock to that store. And uh, obviously, um, there's always an error in your forecast, and let's say the real demand is the adotant light, and you have two forecasts, one is A, another is B, right? So it seems that the forecast A is better, because it's closer to real demand, right? So you say, okay, yeah, I would go for forecast A. But now let's add the cost. So let's say the cost of um, lost sales are, uh, if the costs are non-symmetrical, which is very usually the case in the business, that um, where the holding cost, if you overpredict, the holding costs are much lower so it's actually is better, the forecast B financial is better because now the cost of the misprediction of higher is lower than if you would do just kind of tiny, kind of small under prediction error. So what it shows that if you don't take into, into account cost, your forecast error yeah, may not kind of reflect the true uh, kind of profitability of your, the value of your forecast. So what do we do? So we tried uh, several approaches. Let's say, yeah, coming back, how can you predict the uh, profitability of your model before going uh, into the trial, or even before trying to invest big resources to build your model? So we tried several things. Um, so one is like, you know, yeah, if you have some, a lot of data from historical, what you can do, you can just try to correlate uh, forecast accuracy with uh, financial outcome from your historical data. So do some kind of either some simple kind of regression, or you can do some more elaborate um, kind of nonlinear uh, prediction. Um, what else, we tried also to do this, um, to define some surrogate metrics, right? Because sometimes um, the outcome is not, uh, it's far away, for example, if you're doing um, some buying decisions, uh, at the beginning of the seasons, the issue or the errors in the bank will show up just very at the end of the season where you see, okay, my stock is not selling. Or let's say if you're doing um, um, markdown pricing, clearance pricing, which you do in phases, so anything that you've done in the first phase might not have kind of strong, it's difficult to correlate the impact of the bad prices in the first, let's say, markdown cut with the final outcome of your sale. So what you can do, you can define some kind of surrogate metrics that allows you to relate those short-term um, outcomes with long-term outcomes. And what, uh, and ideally what you can do, you can build this kind of the whole decision simulator. If you know exactly how the, um, the decisions are being made, so you can make that correlation. Um, you, you can simulate uh, the relationship between forecast accuracy or any kind of parameters that drive that decisioning with the, the final outcome. So I'll show you now examples of our analysis, just again, this for illustration purposes. So for example, this is um, analysis that we done for, um, to quantify impact of forecast accuracy and demand forecasting for replenishment. So we correlated uh, lost sales um, of the product, which can be either coming from out of stocks or if the product goes into markdown sales, so again, we're losing kind of margin. And we correlated with uh, errors uh, that we forecast errors of that product uh, um, when we could have made this allocation. So at that point when we still had enough stock to make that um, stock allocation decision. And different points are different stores. So let's say how for, th for that product across different stores, you'll see that where we, um, there's some kind of uh, U-shaped curve. So if you, in, in both, um, if you are kind of under, under predicting kind of that drives your, uh, that correlates with your lost sales and um, with your lost sales, and yeah, the relation which we find is that 3% improvement forecast accuracy relates to 
percent reduction in the lost sales. How, um, is this in real time that you do this? Because obviously the market changes as the sales, as the season, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with fashion. How often are you updating this? Uh, this uh, this is more, no, this is actually historical analysis, just right. to quantify it even before. What factors do you add into there then? So how many contributory factors do you have into this? <coughs> you can extend this. So in this case, we just looked at kind of forecast accuracy. But as you say, the, this whole replenishment system is quite complicated. There are lots of rules that drives, okay, what is the minimum safety stock? How much is the maximum quantity? Should Whether as well, yes, yes, you could add this. Um, for another product, uh, we have this uh, called uh, the whole. Uh, uh, product which is uh, more um, designed to identify underperforming stores in near real time. So it is kind of extension of root cause analysis, but it kind of in near real time kind of correlates performance of the stores with. Uh, expected performance and some other factors, and it can tell you, okay, the store is kind of, for whatever reason, is underperforming, and, and that model allows you to yeah, identify what factors are kind of behind that underperformance is that most of the times it is um, kind of stock uh, kind of uh, inefficiencies, where the which was driven, again, by probably for demand forecasting, or it can be weather or some kind of local events. Um, yeah, another, yeah, so yeah, one you can kind of correlate um, historically forecast accuracy with financial performance. Uh, the other thing that we've done uh, and using successfully is um, to use those uh, surrogate metrics. So, for example, uh, here's an example from the clearance prices in like Markdown. So, what you, the optimal price is, um, is if you sell product uh, not early or before the kind of markdown ends or or, pr or not or without leaving an, an extra stock at the end of markdown. So let's say in this case, um, so this uh, let's say inventory and this is um, time. So when you drop the kind of increase the discount, so the inventory starts going down. So and the markdown ends somewhere there. And uh, for example, this pro first product was uh, probably price could have been higher, discount could have been less because this product sold out early. So we would um, generate more kind of revenue profit if we would sell this product with slightly lower discount and probably the people still would have bought this product and we could have generated kind of more revenue. And vice versa, the, the other product, which was uh, didn't sell out um, until the end of markdown, uh, probably this discount was uh, too low. So what we can do, we can, if we have some another, uh, let's say, a model that generates uh, prices, we can kind of backtest those prices, even though we don't observe the actuals. We can save the, in those cases, where for those products that sold out early, is the new model generating slightly uh, lower discounts? If yes, it means this, that model is uh, directionally better, so we can kind of go ahead and implement those prices. And simulation. So we also um, trying to use simulation, especially for replenishment forecasting. Um, optimizing the replenishment is to try to replicate the whole replenishment uh, uh, process by simulating. So the way replenishment algorithm works, they take demand forecast and they know what is the next time of possible delivery and they, based on your expected demand forecast, they, to ge generate order to the stores. And if the forecast is wrong, so you, uh, you can either order too much or too little. So you can simulate actually this whole process and then you can say then, yeah, what's the impact of your forecast errors on overall um, out of stock situations. Right, yeah, then, uh, yes, so, so this is how we, uh, I talked, how we quantify the value of the forecast accuracy. Now, just briefly about the model complexity. Um, you can always say make model better by making it more usually complex. If you like, you kind of make a better model with keeping the same complexity with data source, that's very good. But you, sometimes it's usually 
you improve uh, and you improve accuracy at the expense of complexity, um, and that's a very kind of tricky kind of situation because yes, you improve the accuracy, but now the forecast might the complex models. What you've noticed is the forecast becomes quite unstable and it can be kind of jumpy. It becomes so sensitive to your inputs that it's tiny variability. Uh, kind of starts uh, generating very different forecasts. And, the, and also you have the model is more complex and it's kind of it's more difficult to maintain. It can have kind of down times and um, it becomes uh, kind of more, kind of less explainable and more opaque, so which is more difficult to explain to the business. And um, yeah, and, uh, and that damages if it's not explainable, it means that you cannot intervene sometimes, and especially in supply chain, like this uh, uh, chief supply manager of uh, Unilever said, like, you know, the agility beats forecasting, <laughs> because in supply chain, things do happen, and you have to be very agile, be able to kind of quickly change your strategies. And if your model is some, some kind of black box that you don't know how it's working and just produces forecast, there's no way you can intervene and kind of do some adjustments. And another example is like, you know, yeah, this from Netflix, yeah, yes, it, it was the model was more accurate that being proposed, but it was never implemented. Yeah, that famous uh, one million Netflix price. Um, yeah, quickly about the errors. Yeah, we use uh, May, Vape, and Bias. I say don't uh, don't go into details, but yeah, MAPE is uh, kind of like you know usually being retired slow, slowly. So yeah, there are lots of um, points about why you should not be using MAPE, but yeah, you can read one of those papers, this lines here. Um, yeah, f now just very quickly about probabilistic forecasting. And sometimes, yeah, we think that if I work hard enough and uh, kind of invest in building the model, I'll make it more accurate, but it's not always the case. For example, if you, some process are in inherently random. So for example, if you yeah, throw the two dice, uh, the average is uh, kind of seven in the long run. And there is like you know 37, and you can try yeah, create invest as much as you want. You will not be able to improve this model, right? Because it is just randomness. So there is nothing that nothing wrong with your models or your features. It's just the process naturally random. So what you have to do, and the way business works, is um, you just have to embrace um, uncertainty and kind of make yourself ready for that uncertainty. And. Um, so ideally, your forecast should incorporate uh, probabilistic um, uh, measures. So you would know, okay, you're not only just predicting um, one kind of point forecast, but giving kind of the whole distribution of the forecast and the different probabilities. And that would allow you to take explicitly into account that uh, no, non-linearity of your cost or or different ways kind of to mit mitigate the cost. So for, for example, in, in, this in this example, so we have, uh, um, again, this from replenishment. So this is distribution. And if you take into, in, into account into accounts lost sales and overstock, so this is, would be the optimal kind of uh, forecast uh, for that product. Not the actual value that we predict, not the mean forecast, but because the, uh, the dip there are there are the costs are asymmetric, then uh, when you have this probabilistic forecast, it, it allows you kind of explicitly take into account those asymmetric costs and calculate what is the most profitable forecast that will minimize the cost instead of just the, your forecasting error. Yeah, and the last but not least, data. So yeah, data is always fun. <laughs> the, Challenge with uh, from data science perspective that in many cases uh, the issues in the data only becomes uh, obvious when you see the uh, um, kind of your prediction or final uh, yes your your prediction or the output of let's say elasticity so um, output of your prediction so yes in not just so it's not enough just to do like you know, incoming data monitoring but you have to put attention to your kind of output monitoring. For example, in these examples, uh, you have price and sales relationship, you drop price, sales increases, but let's say, and data looks fine, then you have another 
kind of price drop, price sale doesn't change, right? So if you look in isolation, the, just the price, you would think, okay, nothing wrong, right? Because it just kind of applies variability. But if you kind of now look at the context with the sales, okay, sales have not increased. Probably the price was uh, not executed or, or some kind of issues with the data. So it would indicate that uh, there are some issues with your, your, your price. And yeah, and doesn't matter how good you, how good your data are. Perhaps you'll have always outages and like you know short term kind of breaks down. And, and business operations, you do need that is not possible. You cannot wait for another day. Let's say if they want to run pricing, um, generate prices for markdown that starts next day or next week, they need prices today. <laughs> Whatever happens, if you don't provide prices, they'll have to come up with some kind of Excel sheet or some um, just random numbers. So you have to be able to have this kind of fallback always, right? So, or create your models more robust that kind of can deal with those situations where some inputs are simply not available. And yeah, so that's the uh, end of the presentation. So if only thing I want to tell you, Mark Spencer has the best value bananas in the town, yeah? 90p, <laughs> good bananas, yeah. <laughs> so come and visit me. Yes. Thanks, Mindis. Uh, we've got time for a few questions, if anybody's got anything they'd like to ask. So, uh, in terms of spike in the data, let's say like a, a massive increase or a decrease in the data that you receive, so the decision that you make, do you still base it based on the data, or you kind of use uh, some uh, heuristic, or you consult uh, an expert in that domain? due to the, the size of the data? Let's say it increased massively or it decreased. Do you still use that in decision making? You mean data quality and that's? I mean, uh, in quantity, let's say you have like a spike, like something unusual in the mm -hmm. data. So do you still uh, make decision based on that? Let's say uh, unusual demands and something has not happened in this past or do you use that? Do you use that part to make decision or? Yeah, we try to clean. We have those kind of like you know checks that uh, makes uh, those ch checks uh, like semi-automatically, and then yeah, if you if there's something out of the range, yeah, we raise, raise a flag, and then someone has to make decision: is that you know explainable or, or okay. valid uh, data yeah. point, or is it has to be kind of fixed or disregarded? Okay. Okay. So I'm just asking: all the decision are data-based decision, not kind of heuristic or you consult like an expert in the domain to, you know, to hit the data? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, any more questions for Mendes? I'm sure he'll be around and happy to take them if uh, people catch him outside. So let's just thank him again. Thank you. Thank you.